these horrible floods we're experiencing all around the world are gonna keep getting worse until we start doing this. I don't know if you've been noticing the same pattern that I am, but these big rainstorms, rain bombs, some people call them, seem to get more and more common. More frequent to get the 100 year flooding event. We're more commonly seeing the 1000 year flooding event. And not only that, but we're having really horrific floods, even with rainstorms that aren't that big. Human activity creates a tremendous difference in how landscapes receive or reject rain. Let's look at the two extremes, the concreted versus vegetated landscape, and how each handles water. This is the same total amount of rain, but different rates and durations of flow. In the concrete landscape, the rain is mostly runoff. The water rushes quickly downhill with very little infiltration. This creates a flood and then the land quickly goes dry. In the vegetated landscape, there's some runoff, but a much smaller portion. Most of the water infiltrates into the ground. Flow continues downstream even long after the last rain. The vegetation transpires water, cooling the atmosphere, and producing microorganisms that seed cloud formation. These cooling clouds reflect the sun's heat Temperatures are stable and balanced. Without the vegetation, there's no cooling and less clouds. The concrete absorbs and re-radiates the heat from the sun. The water vapor forms a warming haze, holding in that heat overnight. This quickly leads to extreme temperatures. And so there's two parts to this problem. One is really the disruption of the hydrological cycle. The moisture cycling of the planet is being disturbed. We explain this in the watershed death spiral that you can check out here. But the big picture there is understanding how as high pressure heat domes are forming, it's resisting the biotic pump that brings moisture in. It's building the pressure of the system until the pressure overwhelms and you get these rain bombs. You get these huge downspouts of water as the normal cycling has been held back. The pressure is built to a breaking point. And so this is becoming more and more common, but we're also seeing really bad floods even with rains that aren't that unusual. And so this is a two-sided issue where we have the hardscapes that are being formed all around the world, sending what water does arrive quickly downstream, creating floods and disaster. And then also because of the disruption of the moisture conveyance cycle of our planet, we're getting bigger storms more commonly with longer droughts in between. The scale and magnitude of the devastation is merciless. Once in a century flood. Rescue and recovery efforts underway this midday after devastating floods. The real reason for the floods we're experiencing, look around and pay attention and you can see for yourself pretty clearly. All of the hard surfaces that you see, where do you think that water goes when it rains? We have the mass and massive dehydration and drainage of our landscapes. This is the biggest ecological issue of our time, yet almost nobody's talking about it. And so I'm going to tell you about it, but also how to fix it. And that's with decentralized water retention. It couldn't get more simple. Holding water in the earth, returning it to the ground can mitigate all of these issues. And there are some truly incredible transformations possible. And just one example, in India, this region, through doing this work, revived seven rivers to perennial flow. Now, why do I say this is the most pressing ecological issue of our time? Well, in reality, we're not going to die from the planet being a few degrees warmer. We're going to die from the flood. We're going to die from the droughts. We're going to die from the fires. And the floods and the fires they don't care if you're rich or poor, they take everything out in its path. 
But just in case you're curious, those projects in India also lowered the temperature two degrees. So how do we save ourselves from these issues? We help the earth receive the rains instead of reject it. We find ways to hold water, to store it on the landscape, and to help it infiltrate into the ground. The hydration makes lush greenery, and the vegetation cools the environment. So in this way, we can work with water and nature to make productivity in abundance. Now, some of you are saying, wait, hold on. Flooding is a story as old as time itself. And yes, you're right. There are times that long, heavy rains cause waterways to fill and flood their banks. But in the natural state of the landscape, this is an incredibly creative event. The water is distributing nutrients and fertility throughout the floodplain. But what happens in the systems we've created? All of that water is concentrated and sent downhill. Buildings, roads, field drains, river dredging. The water concentrates and the force intensifies. Now smaller and smaller rain events are creating destructive floods downstream. Because instead of being received, this water is rejected. Now the landscape dries out more quickly. It's more exposed to drought and to fire. This is a feedback loop leading to the drying and dying of landscapes. This is the watershed death spiral. But we can also reverse this process. We can harness the power and potential of water and life. We can help the heavy rains be received and stored, infiltrated into the ground. The water revives the landscape and the vegetation that results can even cool the climate. Fortunately for these problems, we have a lot of answers. We have a lot of people that have showed away for decades at this point. You can look at the work of the New Water Paradigm team in Slovakia and the Czech Republic. After really bad floods there, they implemented decentralized water retention, a bunch of small Czech dams implemented by local community members, by the people who understood that landscape and where to place things, rather than from a top-down approach, it really democratized the water cycle restoration so that the average people could be involved with this. Now, this really mitigated the flooding to a tremendous degree. At the same time, it recharged the landscape, made more productivity, more life, more biodiversity, all of these great outcomes, but in a very basic level, towns that were flooding every year no longer flood anymore. And so it's really a matter of how much shock absorber we have in the system. If you look the way the landscape used to be, it was water meandering everywhere, distributing to its floodplains, weaving slowly through wetlands and water meanders, really reaching all places and slowly moving through the system with this huge buffering effect. Now we've destroyed most of the world's wetlands. Globally, we've destroyed something like 87% of the world's wetlands. And in some places like California, Australia, we've destroyed 95% of the wetlands. So this natural shock absorber that was in the landscape is no longer there. So the natural consequence is instead of that, those big pulses of water being buffered and slowly moving through the system safely, it's coming through as this giant surge all at once. And our systems can't handle it. We haven't worked with the landscape in a way that it can accept those big punches of water all at once. So it destroys people's houses, it destroys roads, it destroys infrastructure. So much death and destruction from our poor planning, really, when you look at it. From an engineering sense, we try and dewater slopes and hillsides and landscapes in order to make them more stable and amenable to things like buildings, 
roads and parking lots. But that water goes somewhere. It goes downstream and floods and eventually to the ocean, continually dehydrating our landscape. But fortunately, these are areas where we have real proven solutions, where simple things that average people can do at very little cost can mitigate all of this disaster. And now, even if you don't care about making the earth a better place, making a better common future for our next generations, even if you're just only concerned about the economic bottom line, this is still minimum 10 times cheaper than conventional strategies for creating new water sources and it mitigates the flooding and the drought all at once. And if you look at how much money we're spending right now on flood disaster relief, on fire disaster relief, on drought, crop failure, farmer disaster relief, that's way more than it would cost to do these simple small changes. And the wonderful part is we don't need to wait for the government to start doing the right thing, to start being sensible. This is something that we, the people living on these landscapes can do. It's as simple as putting some rocks in the right place, moving some earth around, rearranging some woody debris from trees. All of these things can really make a tremendous difference over time. And the reason they make such a difference is because we're aligning ourselves with the forces of nature. We have essentially this perpetual motion machine, nature, that's incredible in its syntropy, in the building of complexity and order that it creates on its own. And this is a tremendous force. And when we align ourselves with it, we can push the ball in the right direction and then nature takes the reins and really takes it from there. And when we take one step in the right direction, nature can take the next 10, 100, 1,000. If we start pushing it in the right direction, where water is being reconnected with its floodplain, depositing the nutrients and sediments and organic materials that it's carrying, now year after year, we're building soils, we're building hydration, we're building water retention capacity from the one process that we got started. And so this is something that all of you watching can participate in. You, with your own two hands, can give back to the earth and make a real difference. And this is why we started Water Stories, to really get as many hands back into the earth, being earth stewards as possible. Now, if you look at what happens to this water and what could happen with this water, that's where things really get crazy. So just the amount of water that we send away from the landscape each year that used to be held on that landscape. And when it's on that landscape, it's providing all of this cooling through transpiration and evaporation. So evaporation off of bodies of water, wetlands, creeks, anything like this, as the water undergoes that phase change, it's absorbing a huge amount of energy. And same thing for transpiration, evapotranspiration. As the plants consume water, they're absorbing temperature in that phase change. The water is absorbing the temperature. Now, how much? It's hard to conceptualize. So if you look at one liter of water, when one liter of water goes through this beautiful living organism here, that one liter of water absorbs about a car battery's worth of energy. Now, not an electric car, a normal car, but still, it's a huge amount of energy for just one liter of water. That water, water vapor, carries the heat up into the upper atmosphere, which is rapidly cooling, actually, while the lower atmosphere is warming. And if it condenses back into liquid water, forming a droplet, cloud, anything like that, it then releases that energy and most of that goes back out into space. And if you look at the amount of energy that would be processed in that transaction, 
if all of that water is now being sent away quickly downstream, it was actually received by the landscape, it's about 250,000 terawatt hours of energy each year that that water would absorb at the surface and release in the upper atmosphere. Now, what the heck is 250,000 terawatt hours? Well, it's almost 10 times as much energy as all of humanity produces every year. So we have almost an order of magnitude, more energy potential than all of the electrical production all around the world, just in the water that we're sending away each year. That would be absorbing temperature at the surface, releasing it into the upper atmosphere and balancing our climate system. And the wicked part about the floods is they then create the next drought. All that water that should have been received by that landscape, slowly moving through it, now goes all downstream all at once, leaving nothing behind. So we get landscapes that are drying, that are dying, rivers running low, and it's all a consequence of the flood as well. So this example in India, they used the seasonal monsoons to rehydrate their parched landscape. They found ways to hold the water on the landscape. Just one community went from nine hectares to 650 of agricultural production. They've brought water back to 250,000 wells in this region. They've revived seven rivers to perennial flow, and they've reduced the temperature two degrees. There are examples like this all around the world. We just need more people to know about them. So to learn about these, join us at waterstories.com. So I hope you'll join us. I hope you'll pay attention to the waters around you. And I hope you'll realize that these floods, these disasters, these crises, they're not natural, they're man-made. And we can be a keystone species in the restoration of Earth's living systems that resolves these crises that we're currently encountering.